My name is Dan Snyderman. I grew up in a non-Jewish neighborhood. None of my friends were Jewish. I didn't know many Jewish people. The only time I saw Jews was when I went to Temple. I was kind of on the younger side of the, the age group that got into the war. And I was like 18 years old. Before I went into the service, but I was in at the very end. I was in the service in 19... 45 and 46, and the war was over in 46. I was trained as a water supply specialist, but I ended up working as a company clerk. I don't know how they, how that all worked out. It was a, a combination, a grocery store, and tailor shop. My father was a tailor by trade, and they marked on the windows uh, with soap, dirty Jew or something like that on it. Because in the 1930s, there was a lot of friction because of the rise of the Nazis, and there were people who sided with them in, the, in this country. My father would just wash it off. It was just a, a bar of soap. And I asked him, what's that all about? He said, don't pay any attention to it. I did not personally experience a lot of prejudice. And I think part of that was due to the fact that I did live in a neighborhood that was a conglomerate of many different kinds of people. Just for an example, there were at least four different schools within four or five blocks of my house. There was a public school that I went to. There was a Catholic school that um, was right across the street from the public school. There was a German school a couple blocks a different way, and there was a Polish school. And they, they were all full of kids. There was no predominant racial group I think that's probably why I had a different experience because everybody had different backgrounds. There were different ethnic groups, different religions. Nobody predominated. I was more surprised at the way adults reacted. <coughs> and I'll give you two examples. My older brother was five years older than I am. and. When he was in high school, he was trying to raise his hand to answer a question in his 12th grade physics class, and uh, he was the only one apparently that knew the answer, and he was waving his hand in front of the teacher, and the teacher finally said, that's the trouble with you Jews, you just want to have your say all the time. And my brother got very upset, and he got up and walked out, and went to the principal's office. The upshot of the whole thing was the teacher at the very end apologized to him. The man obviously had some feelings about people that were Jewish. Five years later when I was in that school, this guy used to follow me around sometimes and ask me questions and wanted to know if everything was all right. He was very sarcastic. My brother said, just don't pay any attention to him. So that's basically the way I handled that. But I had my own experience with an, with an adult. When I was a freshman in college, I took a public speaking class. We picked out different speeches. For whatever reason, I did pick the subject of prejudice and how to deal with it. From that time on, I never got higher than a C in that class. I was so mad at this guy because I knew what he was doing. I figured, okay, I'm going to kill the final. No matter what happens, I'll kill the final. I studied for that. He had to give me a decent grade. It was the kind of test where there was a right answer and that was the end of it. I aced it, but at the same time I ended up with a C in the class. I was very angry at him. And I was angry at myself for picking, picking a subject which told him something about me personally, which I shouldn't have. But I didn't know that he was prejudiced. And I think that was a, more, more than kids my own age. When I got involved with a adults that I didn't expect to have that kind of behavior, that bothered me more than anything else. As far as people my own age, I never had any trouble with them. 
other than normal kids' trouble. I had my fights, and I, I lost some, and I won some. <laughs> you gotta stand up for yourself. I mean, if you don't, people just keep pushing you. If you're in a situation where you can't, get out of it. If you can, you know, you really do need to stand up for yourself. I was stationed in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, which is 12 miles outside of Washington, D.C. Every weekend, you get on a bus and you go into into Washington, D.C. The bus stop that I would get off at was right across the street from the Smithsonian Institute. And I used to love to spend a couple hours there before I went on my other rounds and went to the USO. I saw a lot of Washington, D.C. I had a cousin who was two years older than I am. And she was in the nurse's training program in Washington, D.C. I would visit with her. We played together when we were three, four, five years old. But that was a nice experience. When you're a soldier in the service, you get a lot of freebies. <laughs> there was a museum that had just opened up in Washington, D.C. around that time, a brand new museum. And I got free tickets to go to a, a big dinner there. And I was very impressed. <laughs> customers in the 1930s was the mayor of Pittsburgh and he was very proud of that and we would go with him shop for fruit and vegetables down at the markets. We would only buy enough to be sure that we could sell it and we all worked there really. Stock the shelves with cans as well as going to the fruit markets. It used to fascinate me to see these whole bananas in a refrigerated room and it always amused me when they advertised don't put bananas in the refrigerator because it slows down their <laughs> ripening. Every wholesaler has the bananas in the refrigerator because they don't want them to spoil. <laughs> I hope your project is a success. <laughs>